I want to say thank you for everyone that's uh, joining us today. My name is Anissa Avon with Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions, and I'm super excited to talk about um, the work of leaders, a really remarkable um, leadership development program that we've worked with a number of organizations on, and and I'm um, super excited to have Annie Kirshenman of AKA Coaching Company on the call. She's our expert on call when it comes to uh, leadership development and using this particular model. Um, I really want to honor everyone's time today, so I know that there's folks that are coming on still, but we're just going to move along and get on started. So um, that's me on uh, evidently a good hair day. Um, my name, <laughs> again, is Anissa Avon. <laughs> and uh, Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions is my company. Um, I really, really love what we do. We've been working in the leadership development, management, consulting, coaching, training space um, since 2004. So um, I am proud to say that we have moved past the decade space and, and are um, really beginning to learn and apply what practices are actually driving the greatest change um, with our clients and thus the reason for our conversation today with Annie about uh, the work of leaders. So Annie, I am I would love I'm going to introduce you and then the truth is is that every time I speak to Annie, I learn something more magnificent and wonderful and creative about her. So I <laughs> I want you to know that I'm going to introduce you, but I expect you to also tell us a little bit more about you um, because I'm never going to be able to capture all of your magnificence. So I am proud to say that Annie has been working with Turnkey Coaching and Development Solutions probably 10 years, it feels like. Um, I have grown very fond of her as a um, business mentor, as a master trainer and executive coach, um, and as a friend. She has delivered some programs for a number of our clients and never fails to over-deliver. Um, she is a board-certified coach with a specialty designation of executive corporate business and leadership, which, by the way, very few percentage of the board-certified coaches have that designation. Um, she has been a business person for a number of years, if I were to say too many decades, um, you think she's really old, but the truth is it is a number of decades. <laughs> um, she, what's really clever uh, about Annie, though, is her take on innovation. And when you get to know Annie, it's from her background in the arts. Um, and she's going to share a little bit more about that. But it's, it's amazing how she can take this background of creativity and art and apply it in a space of leadership development or executive coaching that really provides a space for innovation in, in a way that I've seen very few trainers and coaches be able to accomplish. Um, interesting, she is a former executive CEO of a very successful organization. Um, she and Turnkey both are authorized partners for Everything Disc and Wiley Brand. And here's what's great about this model she's going to share today. She's been working with this model since 2011. So she understands when it's effective, when it's not, and how to tweak any leadership development program in order to make it culture specific and individual um, unique. So Annie, tell us a little bit about you and what you're going to share with us today. Well, thank you so much, Anissa. Pleasure, as always. And, uh, you know, I would love to talk a little bit more about myself, but we have so much content to cover today in such a short <laughs> period of time that what I'd like to do is, is um, extend an invitation to anyone uh, who's attending today. If you want to know a little bit more about me, please feel free to reach out. Um, I'll be happy to share more about my background, and you'll be getting our contact information. Uh, at the end of the program. Does that, does that sound good? Perfect. Okay, great. So thank you for that wonderful introduction. And uh, here we go. Uh, this is about the work of leaders. This is an introduction to the program, which was developed by Inscape Publishing. It's now a Wiley company. It's based on some very extensive research, which we'll cover in a moment, on what makes a good leader. And it is part of the Everything Disc family of behavioral style assessments. One of the reasons that I just love this program is because it's a real leadership how-to. Uh, it gives you a roadmap for 
uh, the job of leaders. And if you follow that map, um, chances are you're going to do a pretty good job as a leader. So I'm excited to share that with everybody who is here today. And as we get started, uh, let's uh, tap what participants know about good leadership. Uh, what I'd like to invite everybody to do is to identify three elements of leadership that you find most important. This would just be like one or two words each. Um, and go ahead and write them down in your notes. And then share a few of your thoughts in the chat box. And Anissa, if you can help me out by uh, reading what people type into the chat box. Yeah, we have a couple. Um, the, the first one that came in is emotional intelligence. Mm. Um, another one here, strategic agility. Um, uh, we must have some HR folks on the call because we're using very wise words when it comes to describing elements of leadership. Um, <laughs> a good communicator, um, ability to motivate others, Super. Yeah. All good and all correct, too. <laughs> Excellent. Any other thoughts before we move on? I think we're, we're already getting to see that leadership is a very diverse, um, it's a very diverse job. There's lots of elements that go into leadership excellence, just from the few shares that we've had here. Anything else coming in, Anissa? No, I don't see anything just yet. Okay. Well, that's good food for thought, and thank you for those of you who shared that. Um, excellent, excellent thoughts about leadership. Um, the goals for today's introductory training. Um, this is a data-rich program, and there's a lot to know about it and how to use it. So our objective today is to provide a high-level overview while at the same time giving you some information that you can start to use right away. Um, or at the very least, we'll provide you with some food for leadership thought. Um, so as such, we're going to be looking at the introduction to the work of leaders and we're going to do a quick review of the best practices in this program for leadership excellence. And for those of you who might be interested in taking a deeper dive, uh, we'll be providing information uh, about opportunities for that towards the end of the session if you'd like to learn more uh, about what we can't cover today. <laughs> Okay, so uh, please take notes on what you learn, notes that are meaningful for you. If you have questions as we go through the program today, uh, please go ahead and type them into the chat box. We'll take uh, questions and comments uh, at the end of the session, but please feel free to put your, put your questions into the chat box as we go okay. through the program. Annie, I just realized I wasn't in the right box. So we do have a, additional ones, fair, oh, okay. integrity, transparency, innovation, patience. So thank you guys for typing those in. Um, user error, I was not able to see them. <laughs> <laughs> okay, great. Well, that's that again, that fleshes out um, the point about diversity and, and what a big job leadership is. All of those things are components of good leadership. Okay, so uh, we are now going to look at a video introduction to the work of leaders. Uh, so this will give us, uh, uh, again, part of that high-level overview of what we're talking about here. Why are you here? Because you're a leader. And like all leaders, you probably have your own ideas about leadership, your own experience, your own approach. But the question is, could you lead better? A whole lot better? A tiny bit better? Better, period. First, what do we mean by leadership? For today, let's look at leadership as a one-to-many relationship. A leader leads a group of people. It might be eight people. It might be 80 or maybe even 8,000. It doesn't matter how big or small your group is. You're a leader. That's why you're here. You've been asked to lead a group of people from point A to point B. And how do you get there? Craft the vision. Build alignment. Champion execution. 
Do these things well, and chances are that people will be energized and willing to follow you again. Vision, alignment, execution. It's a simple process that we'll bring to life through leadership best practices. Some of these will come more naturally to you than others. You'll learn these best practices using what we call behavioral continua that look like this. The right-hand side represents the best practice for that aspect of leadership. For example, when it's time to explore a vision, successful leaders remain open. Sure, there's a time for seeking closure, just not when you're exploring a vision. And if you're more toward the left, it doesn't mean you can't explore a vision. It just takes more energy to get there. Any movement toward the best practices on the right can improve your leadership effectiveness. You may be wondering, where did these best practices come from? From analyzing the work of the best known leadership researchers and authors. From consulting with 300 leadership development experts in more than 150 organizations. And from collecting and analyzing hundreds of thousands of item responses from leaders and their followers. We did this with one goal in mind, to help you think better. With a simple practical tool to help improve the work you do every day. Crafting a vision, building alignment, championing execution. What we call the work of leaders. Okay, so Anissa, can you hear me all right? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. Thank you. Okay, so just to recap uh, a few things and take it a little bit deeper uh, from that video, uh, we are talking about over four years of research and development that went into this program. Again, analyzing and distilling at least three decades of leadership research and interviewing uh, surveying, talking with uh, 300 subject matter experts from more than 150 organizations, so a lot went into uh, developing uh, the idea of the work of leaders. Uh, it's important to remember that in this program we are defining leadership as a one-to-many relationship. That's as contrasted with uh, a manager, which tends to be a one-to-one -one re relationship. There are several important principles that are uh, foundational in this program. Uh, I, one of the reasons I call this a leadership how-to is that it's designed to provide tangible steps to lead to results, which is, of course, what we're all after. Um, it's for leaders at all levels in the organization, so this is not just a C-suite program. Um, and the best practices that we're going to be talking about in just a moment are context specific. So we'll be getting to a little bit more about that in a moment. And uh, what you're seeing right here on this page, the visual is a, a page from the Work of Leaders report. Um, and if anyone's interested, we can surely provide you with a free sample of that report if you'd like to take a look. So you can be in touch with Turnkey about that if that's interesting to you. Okay, and here is the work of leaders. Uh, this is again the snapshot of the different jobs of leadership uh, with each of their drivers and then the best practices under that. Uh, we're going to go ahead and deconstruct that for you now. Okay, so in the work of leaders, there are three fundamental leadership jobs. And as we saw in the video, these are vision, alignment, and execution. So they're organized in this way. Uh, this is forming part of the map, the work of leaders map. Um, so each job, in this case we're, we're looking at crafting a vision, the, the first job of leadership. Each job has three drivers underneath of it. So in this case you see the three drivers of vision are exploration, boldness, and testing assumptions. And then underneath each of the drivers there are two best practices. So again, in this case, you can see the two best practices for the driver of exploration are remaining open and prior prioritizing, excuse me, the big picture. 
each best practice occurs on a continuum. So as you can see here, um, the two poles, if you will, of this continuum are remaining open, which is the best practice, um, and the other end is seeking closure. And as we go through the program today and our slides, the best practice, what's considered the best practice for each of the drivers will always be on the right-hand side of your screen. So it's organized so that you can just kind of line those up on the, on the right-hand side of your screen. And whatever is on the left-hand side of the screen will be considered the opposite of the best practice for that particular, um, for that particular job. Okay, so we're going to take a deeper dive into that in a moment, uh, but we're going to begin with a game. So get ready to type in your chat box there. Uh, this is a vision trivia game, and what I'm going to do is uh, put forward a vision from a well-known organization or company, and I'd like you to type your guess of the name of the organization that promoted that vision in the chat box. So here we go with our first one. This is a vision from a well-known organization, and it is to put a computer on every desk and in every home. So go ahead and type in the chat box, what's your guess about the organization that promoted that vision? We have uh, an HP, we have Apple, we have Dell, we have another Apple, we have an IBM, we have a Microsoft, HP, Dell. Okay. Pick me, I know, I know. Oh, wait. There, <laughs> there is a winner in there. <laughs> And little drum roll, da da da. It is Microsoft. <laughs> Add okay. That. okay, let's do another one. Here's the vision organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. What organization promoted that vision? We've got um, Susan says Google. Any other guesses there? Not at the moment. Okay. Have you ever stumped them? Or they're all like, yeah, we know that one. We know that one, yeah. <laughs> well, you yeah, can see how powerful how powerful a vision is, right? <laughs> right. It, it is in fact Google. Very good. Okay, Bobby, and let cool. sorry, go ahead. Sorry, Bobby also said, Yep, Google. Google. <laughs> no brainer. Okay, last one. Bring girls out of their cloistered home environments to serve in their communities and experience the open air. What organization promoted that vision? Christina says Girl Scouts. Okay. Um, Sheila says Girls on the Run. Girls on the Run. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Susan says Girl Scouts. Okay. All right, very good. It is, in fact, Girl Scouts of America. So back from two, or 1912, this, uh, this vision has been in motion. So again, the, the trivia game is kind of fun, but it helps to point out uh, the power of vision in uh, leadership of an organization or team or company. Um, but what do we mean when we're talking about vision in the work of leaders? So as it's defined for this program, Vision is an imagined future condition. And as such, it's broader in scope than a goal. Uh, it seeks to create unquestionable value, to serve in an unparalleled way, and to reinvent how the organization does business. It's powerful stuff. As I mentioned a little bit earlier, this is not just for the C-suite. Um, in terms of creating a vision, it's leaders at all levels in an organization that are responsible for vision. Um, of course, align to support the organization's overall vision. And because of that, it might look different in, for example, different departments um, than the top level vision. But each vision as you go through an organization is equally important. Okay, so crafting a vision, uh, here are the three key drivers 
uh, as we saw in a previous slide, they are exploration, boldness, and testing assumptions. So let's go ahead now and take a look at the best practices under exploration. Uh, as I mentioned before, best practice always on the right hand side of your screen. Uh, and when we are involved in the job of exploration, the best, one of the best practices is remaining open. That is entertaining new ideas, new possibilities, and, and not rushing to finalize plans. Um, as contrasted with seeking closure, which is making decisions quickly and finalizing those plans right away, preferring not to revisit options. And as we saw in our video, uh, there is a time to seek closure, absolutely, in, in this process. However, just not when you're exploring a vision. So that, that's why these best practices are considered context specific. So second best practice here is prioritizing the big picture. So again, focusing on the broad overall view um, of an idea or project, uh, contrasted with prioritizing the details. So that would be attending to the individual elements to ensure they're workable. Again, important time for that in this process, just not at this point. Okay, so we're going to watch another short video here uh, where two leaders illustrate the opposite ends of these continua. Exploration is one of my favorite parts of being a leader. I like letting go and not worrying about where we're headed or how long it's going to take to get there. How do I approach exploration? It's okay, as long as it has a clear beginning and end, and we don't get too far out there talking about things that are impossible. Early on, I let my mind wander and not worry about how it's going to work. In fact, I enjoy wrestling with the gray areas. It's all right if your vision starts out with some question marks and unknowns. I don't like starting from a blank piece of paper. I want to start with what we already know. And when people are coming up with ideas that don't seem realistic, it makes me uncomfortable. For me, it's about imagining how things could be better in the future. I'm focused on the big picture, the benefits of doing something that may even seem impossible right now. Also, when we're exploring ideas, I immediately think about the details involved in doing it. And if it doesn't seem feasible, I don't want to waste time on it. I want to move on to the next idea. Okay, so in that video example, uh, of course, Carlos, the leader Carlos, is probably going to have an easier time with exploration because he naturally aligns with those best practices of remaining open and prioritizing the big picture. Now, this doesn't mean that Georgia, who tends to be more to the left-hand side of the continua, doesn't mean she can't do these best practices. It simply means that it's probably going to take more of her energy to get to those best practices because they don't come naturally to her. So as we go through the best practices today, um, it, again, just a reminder, it will always be true that the preferred practice is on the right, and if your particular leadership style aligns with the best practice, it will take less of your energy. If your particular leadership style aligns with the left-hand side, it's probably going to take more of your energy. Okay, so let's look at the driver of boldness and the best practices here. First one is adventurous, so that's the enjoyment uh, of the excitement of taking risks and being comfortable with unknowns, uh, contrasted with cautious, which is to minimize risk and uncertainty. And speaking out. So that best practice is being willing to volunteer bold ideas and, and even put your credibility on the line from time to time in exploring a vision, um, as contrasted with holding back. So the hesitancy to say anything that might be challenged or to put credibility on the line. Okay, we're going to be looking at our last driver here. Um, and to illustrate some of the importance of this last driver, um, we're going to be taking a look at this great idea, right? Seat back phones on airplanes. And we're going to do a little poll right now. 
Uh, how many of you ever used one of these? Go ahead and put your poll in there. Your answer to the poll, yes or no. Did you ever use one of these? Uh, it was, it's coming out as we probably would expect. About 71% say no and about 29% say yes. Okay, perfect. All right, yes, you are proving the point. Um, <laughs> actually, only one airline in the entire industry ever tested the assumption that seatback phones on airplanes were a good idea. Um, and in their focus groups, the uh, usage estimate uh, was 1.5 passengers per flight. And when their customers were uh, queried about why they wouldn't use it, uh, they pointed to the cost factor deterrent. Um, if you ever looked at one of those seatback phones, you know they were really expensive to use. Um, so that one airline did not install seatback phones. Every other airline did, and they put them in to great expense, and then a few years later, they took them out to great expense. Um, thousands and thousands of dollars uh, wasted, basically, on this really great, quote-unquote, idea because the assumption was never tested. So this is a very, very important part of the vision before we move on to any other job in leadership is to test the assumptions. And the best practices here are seeking counsel, which is to consult with trusted advisors or your customers um, to help evaluate the risks and the outcomes. Uh, as opposed to deciding independently, so preferring to make decisions autonomously without asking for input and exploring the implications uh, as this one airline did. By the way, it wasn't a major airline, it was America West who, who did testing assumptions. Interesting piece of trivia there. The second best practice is to explore the implications, that is showing patience in evaluating ideas to determine the potential benefits and drawbacks. Uh, contrasted with pushing forward, so prioritizing quick progress and perhaps finding it difficult to be patient with careful evaluation. And if you think back to our uh, video examples of leadership, Carlos and Georgia, um, it's quite likely that when it comes to testing assumptions, uh, Georgia is going to be much more aligned with the best practices because of her particular style and Carlos would probably have a more difficult time uh, with testing assumptions given his, given his leadership preferences. Okay, so let's go on to our uh, second job, which is building alignment. And the three key drivers here are clarity, dialogue, and inspiration. How are we defining alignment? So basically, it's getting buy-in to the vision from those involved. And that's both from a task perspective as well as an emotional perspective. And we'll see that in the best practices here. So alignment is a critical job. It's a critical step for the vision to become a reality. And it requires continual communication. I'm thinking back to what somebody wrote uh, as a leadership skill re requiring good communication, absolutely. And, and this is um, upward, downward, and lateral. And I think really important here is the word continual. Communication in the alignment phase is not just a one-time event. It goes on throughout the alignment, the job of alignment. So let's take a look at our best practices here. Our first driver is clarity, and the first best practice is explaining the rationale, which is to communicate the reasoning and facts behind an idea or decision. Contrasted with offering intuition, which is the tendency to communicate more with personal feelings and opinions. Structured messaging, so organizing what you want to say as a leader and make it easier for others to understand as opposed to impromptu messaging um, where leaders tend not to invest energy in organizing what they have to say and therefore sacrifice clarity. The second driver is dialogue. 
And the best practice is here, you can see on the right hand side of the screen. So exchange perspectives. So as a leader, encouraging dialogue around new ideas and information, um, as opposed to just presenting information, which is to communicate new ideas and information without any room for discussion. And being receptive, the second best practice here. So inviting and appreciating different points of view in the alignment building process. Uh, that's as opposed to contrasted with being challenging. So responding to questions um, with skepticism and, uh, and discounting different points of view. Not a best practice here. Okay, and the third driver is inspiration. And here you see the best practices. Uh, first is expressive. So uh, when uh, generating inspiration, leaders want to be upbeat and communicate in an open and lively manner, uh, as contrasted with being reserved and displaying little emotion, even when you're excited about something. And the best practice of being encouraging, which is to inspire others to believe in the importance of their work and their contributions. Uh, as opposed to being matter of fact, uh, that is straightforward, practical, and tending to focus on the facts. Okay, so that you go ahead. Sure. Uh, you know, when it when it comes to this particular piece, there are plenty of successful leaders that are more introverted, um, and this particular piece, reserved versus expressive. What has been your experience with those who are introverted being able to have this data so that they can see how perhaps their executive presence, for example, might be compromised in the view of others if they don't find a way to move towards, when appropriate, a more expressive style? Or do they need to? Can they continue mm. to stay on the left and maximize their personal leadership capacity? Well, it, that's a really great question and, and something uh, that it doesn't really have a quick answer. Um, it, again, we're thinking about these as context-specific um, best practices. That being said, um, a leader who's more reserved is going to do expressive as a best practice in a, in a different way than, uh, than a leader who tends to be more outgoing. Um, I think the key here is uh, that that the communications are upbeat and open and tend towards uh, warmth and, and liveliness and every different every leader is going to have a, a unique way of doing that um, so it, it, again it's all um, it's all about doing the best you can within your particular style preferences to, to move the dial towards the best practice on the right uh, and, and you're going to do it differently than I do, and we're, somebody who is more reserved is going to do it differently, but it doesn't mean that it's invalid. Does that answer the, your question? It does. Thank you. Okay, great. Super. Thank you for that. Okay, so uh, that was our quick trip through the job of alignment. And you may be wondering uh, how we figure out whether or not these practices come naturally to you or not. Um, and uh, this is a quick FYI. Uh, it represents eight leadership priorities that are embedded in this particular program. Uh, and DISC is part of how we establish that. So I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the, the DISC uh, behavioral style assessment. So it's a leader's priorities and preferences which determine which best practices will come naturally and which ones will require more effort. So for example, looking at this model, um, I fall within the ID range uh, towards the top of the circle there. And I prioritize being pioneering, commanding, energizing, and affirming. So any best practice that requires those approaches is naturally going to come more easily to me. Um, best practices that don't require those priorities um, are going to be more difficult. 
for me, and I can tell you they have been. <laughs> um, uh, there is a video introduction to these priorities that we're not able to share today for time. Um, however, for anyone wanting to learn more about that, as I mentioned earlier, um, we will provide an opportunity to, um, to talk with you about that, and we'll show the video then. Okay, so let us move now to our last job, which is championing execution. And here the three key drivers are momentum, structure, and feedback. So what is execution? Um, in the work of leaders, we define execution as turning the imagined future condition, that's the vision, into reality. And we do draw a distinction here uh, between the job of the manager and the job of the leader in the execution phase. Uh, you'll remember uh, leadership here is defined as a one-to-many relationship. So because of that, it's the manager's job to guide the day-to-day -day work of execution while leaders ensure strategies and people are in place to make the vision a reality. So a bit of a distinction there on jobs. Okay, so in the momentum driver, you can see the two best practices here. The first one is driven, so urging others to move quickly when we're building momentum. And um, uh, some leaders can actually start to feel themselves get annoyed when people lack a sense of urgency. I don't know that that's necessarily a big pra best practice, but it, it does happen. Um, as opposed to being more low-key. Um, and tending to be laid back and uncomfortable encouraging others to pick up the pace. Again, in building momentum, we want to, uh, we want to inspire that drive as leaders. And initiating, so anticipating opportunities and problems and calling attention to them. Uh, so uh, that's contrasted with being reactive and taking action as the result of an event or problem uh, and being unlikely to seek new opportunities. Second driver is structure. Uh, first best practice there is plan. So developing an organized course of action, setting clear expectations and deadlines, um, as opposed to improvising, which is figuring things out as you go along without much planning or preparation. Then second best practice here is analyzing in depth, uh, performing a thorough examination of facts and details, as opposed to following first impressions, which is relying on your initial feelings and views when moving forward. Okay, so last driver uh, in this particular uh, area, this particular job of leadership, is feedback and the two best practices here are addressing problems which is dealing with issues in a straightforward way and letting others know when there are concerns as opposed to maintaining harmony which is to keep a calm peaceful environment and tending to be uncomfortable with confronting others with problems and second best practice, offering praise. So looking for opportunities to compliment others and recognize their contributions, uh, as opposed to offering less praise where the leader might be uncomfortable or feel it unnecessary to compliment others or recognize contributions. Okay, and to illustrate this point, uh, I think we have time for it, we're going to watch this leader, Charles, as he models the three different approaches to feedback. So as we go through these, uh, through these different uh, approaches to feedback, uh, see if you can figure out where Charles is modeling both of these best practices, addressing problems and offering praise. I've got to be honest with you, this is not what I was expecting. What happened to our sense of humor? This thing is really dry. You know that the quirky personality of the website is what makes us special. We can't afford to lose it. If we're going to succeed in the rest of the world, people are going to have to see us as innovative the way they do here. You're going to have to go back and start over. Wow, this team always does such great work. The new design is really nice. I like how consistent it is between the different languages. I guess 
it doesn't quite make you laugh like the original site, but humor is so hard to translate. Maybe we could try something to amp it up a little. But at least you've done a good job at making it accessible in other languages, so keep up the good work. First, let me say, I can see a lot of really good work has been done here. You've done a great job of making it simple to navigate through all the different languages. But I, I see you dropped some of the most humorous and popular parts of the site. I don't know why those choices were made, but we need to revisit them. Our quirky humor shows how innovative we are. I think we need to push ourselves and understand what can be done to recapture more of the attitude and personality of the original website. I'd like you to take another shot at this. This team has come up with our best work. So this is another chance to shine. I look forward to seeing what you can come up with. OK, so uh, I like to include this example of feedback uh, because in my own work of leaders profile on the first best practice continuum, I'm more to the side of maintaining harmony. And on the second, I'm more towards offering praise. And really, it wasn't until I saw these video examples that I, I, I could not imagine that it would be possible to do both of these best practices, address problems and offer praise at the same time. So this was a real eye-opener for me. And what I've noticed is that the same predicament um, exists with many of my clients. Uh, so I offer it here as a potential aha moment and an illustration of um, what this program can do for you. So, of course, it's video number three that's the winner where Charles models both best practices. So, okay, so uh, I'm looking at our time here. That was our quick trip uh, through the work of leaders. Uh, do we have a few questions, Anissa? We do. We have a couple. Um, uh, Felicia um, asked the question, there seems to be a correlation between the best practices and leadership competencies. How are the best practices used in evaluating leadership performance or readiness for leadership? Oh, that's a great question. So uh, what we were not able to go into are the components of this program, but it is an assessment-based program. So the leader or potential leader um, takes uh, an assessment that uh, not only looks at um, behavioral style preferences, but also uh, tests the, if you will, tests the leader on um, things that, that he or she feels comfortable with and feels uncomfortable with. So you get a report of that, um, which is incredibly valuable in coaching, in supervision, um, in you know, helping leaders to develop capacity. Uh, so I, I think that answers your question. If, the, if I have not gotten to the core of it, please let me know. I, I think that, that helps. One of the things that I'd like to hear you talk a little bit about, Annie, are the pieces of um, so often we ha work with leaders who really want to focus on the third competency or the third bucket, so to speak, and that's the execution piece. Mm -hmm. And all of the other best practices, vision and alignment, um, oftentimes get overlooked or minimized. What has been your experience when an organization uses um, vision, alignment, and execution to really move the needle on their leadership effectiveness? Mm. Well, it's, uh, it's pretty powerful. And uh, my personal experience is uh, that it moved the dial. Uh, maybe goes uh, explodes through the roof <laughs> would be more uh, more to the point uh, when a, an organization and the leaders within the organization are attending to these leadership jobs and the, the, the steps the best practices within each of these jobs in a very intentional and systematic way um, it, it, it's almost impossible to fail and uh, yeah if you go straight for execution, and I agree with you that I think, you know, again, we're leaders, we're about results. That's our job is to create results. So we tend to jump there. But if we don't have alignment, if we don't have our teams in alignment, if we don't have our companies in alignment, um, all kinds of problems are going to show up in execution um, that's, that's going to make it at, the, at best makes execution more difficult um, and at worst, 
uh, creates failure because people aren't on board. So each one of these steps is very um, uh, thoughtfully and, and systematically designed and, and the order in which we take them also um, very intentional. Very good. That's very helpful. Um, when it comes to how leadership development must be uh, addressed differently at the different levels, an executive um, and the C-suite is going to have a very different background and history of their own leadership journey that's very different than, say, um, a middle management or a high potential or even the front line. You had mentioned earlier that this program and these particular competency development best practices work for all levels of leaders. Can you explain that mm -hmm. a little bit? Because it's sure. easy to be skeptical thinking, okay, <laughs> one size fits all, how does that work? Right, absolutely. So uh, again, there's a lot that could be said about that, but, but putting it in, a, in broad strokes. Um, your C-suite executive leadership is going to hold the vision for the, the, the broad vision for the company overall. So that would be like our examples from the trivia the, the trivia. That, that's that's C-suite level, right? Um, and then if you, the departments, so let's talk, just use that as an example. So if you're a leader of the department and part of your job is to align with the executive um, uh, vision and you're the head of the IT department, well, if you want to de deliver a vision that's in alignment with the C-suite, your vision is going gonna, is gonna to be about what your IT department it delivers to, to make that vision um, a reality, the, the C-suite vision. So the, the, the important points here are uh, whatever your leadership job is within the organization, your vision for, let's just say department, because that's an easy example, your vision is going to be about what your department contributes to, to making that vision a reality. So you get different um, facets of the vision that are all um, all lined up with um, with the big vision, if if I can use that word from from the executive leadership. That makes sense. Can you speak a little bit more about um, frontline leaders, though? For example, managing vision is not something that a typical supervisor I is accustomed to. How might a frontline supervisor or middle management that maybe doesn't have a department, but maybe has a couple of folks that they uh, that report to them. Um, how might they benefit from these competencies that typically speaking are only addressed at higher levels? Sure. And that's a good question and, and the answer to it briefly would would <laughs> would be it depends. So, you know, we are drawing a distinction in this program between leadership and management. So, uh, not every manager is uh, is a leader. And so, that would be the first thing that, that we'd have to ferret out. It's like, what is the job of, of this person? Is it a leadership job or is it a management job? Um, and if it's, a, if it's determined that it is, in fact, a leadership job, um, then again, that because this program is is such a step by step how to, um, it I think it really gives confidence to um, frontline leadership uh, to to be able to step into um, into more of a leadership than a than a management role and drive uh, the initiative of the organization. You're talking about even using it to support your employees on a career path helping them to understand that at whatever level of managerial position they may be in, that these particular competencies will apply at every level across an organization. And it Absolutely. Context specific, but nevertheless, this puts it into a formula that could support an enterprise um, leadership lexicon, so to speak. Absolutely. So it, it's a really powerful tool for leadership development. So I, I know um, a lot of organizations that have intentional um, leadership capacity developing programs, so emerging leaders, uh, perfect for them to, to get this right from the get-go. Um, and people who've been in the job for a long time have a lot of, a lot of aha moments <laughs> during, during this program and, uh, and can become more effective leaders.
Yeah. So I'm noticing our time, Anissa. Uh, I think we need to move on. Uh, and if there are questions that weren't answered, again, we're going to be providing contact information. So please reach out with those questions if we didn't answer uh, something that is important to you. Uh, we're going to do a brief wrap up here and then I'm going to turn it over to Anissa to talk to you about that opportunity to take a deeper dive. Um, so briefly, uh, what are you taking away from today? What, what stands out in your mind? Um, has anything made you curious? Uh, is there anything about which you'd like to know more? Uh, and how will you use this information? Is, has it been food for thought for you? And just go ahead and uh, share a few of your thoughts in the chat box. I know uh, for me, my takeaway is, is really being reminded of the continua. Um, understanding that my own personal weaknesses, when I'm on the left side as a leader, are not necessarily, um, there are times when I think about some of these uh, issues, for example, um, on the left side as part of my style or how I get things done or how I keep peace. And in watching this again, what I'm really recognizing is that that continua is in fact essential for a leader to understand. But what I find difficult in other programs is the clarity about that, the clarity of, okay, great, I know that I'm not effective at giving feedback. What's the answer for me to develop more effectiveness quickly? And that continua really makes it black and white. Yeah, absolutely, and and it and it's clear, um, you know what what you as a leader have to do, what kind of energy you have to bring to to that job, which is so valuable, so valuable, because you know you can gear yourself up for it <laughs> if it's not your forte, um, and and that's that's invaluable. So it's great. Thank you for that. Um, are there any other takeaways? Any other shares at, at this point? Seeing any additional at this time? Okay, well then um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you, David, if you can uh, switch to Anissa, please, so she can show her screen. All right, so since we are switching um, to my screen, can you guys tell me, do you see my chat box here or do you see just a single image? I know. I don't see anything at this point. <laughs> Sorry to say. <laughs> um, Sheila is uh, on the call, and I asked her to tell me if she could see everything. I want to make sure that I'm showing you guys the, the right screen. Um, I can see your screen great, Anissa. Okay, great. And do you see the um, two-day training work of leaders on a single page or the double pane? Um, I would say one 60% bigger than the other, so double pane, yeah. Okay, you're seeing the double pane. All right, so let me switch it over. It doesn't matter. I'm not sure how to do that at this moment. So one of the things that uh, we've, we've been working on is offering some pilot opportunities for folks who want to test the waters on the work of leaders or de determine whether or not the work of leaders is actually a good fit. Um, for their organization. We are really clear that depending on the other leadership development programs that an organization has been using or not, um, plenty of organizations don't really have formalized instruction um, for their leadership journey, so to speak. Um, and, and so they're looking at evaluating how do we maximize our budget, get our leaders trained, and move the needle on effectiveness. And so one of the things that we always do is offer a complimentary organizational development consultation um, that's typically about a 30 to 60 minute conversation. And it's, it's not a conversation about, hey, we've got this great program. How can we convince you of that? It's a conversation around what are you guys doing? What are your goals? How can we support you in achieving your goals? Oh, what you're wanting may not be a fit to what we do, but let's, let me support you in out, outlining um, those potential next steps. So anyone that's on the call today that would like to take advantage of our organizational development consultation, we are offering an opportunity to get a free book for the first 10 folks who give us a call or shoot us an email and say, not sure if we're a good fit, but I do have some goals around organizational development. I'd like to take advantage of that. Um, so we're, you're going to love that book, so don't hesitate to give us a call um, if you think that you would like to grab that book and um, 
be provided with an OD consultation. So it's a we, great book. It 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 really, it really, yeah. really or you know outlines the information in in this in this program. It's a great I book. Agree. And one of the things that we've done is we did a pilot program for another organization, and so we decided that we would put together uh, a program for um, the Whitmarsh Consulting Group friends, and thank you, David, for being on the call with us and inviting um, folks to join us today. So one of the things I we do a little bit differently than um, our peers or competitors, for example, is we put a lot of value into making sure that every program is entirely customized for our clients. And so what that means um, is the we take about five plus hours, sometimes more, depending on the organization, to really do company discovery, key stakeholder interviews, and put that into the, the context so that we're able to talk about the context of your organization inside the training itself. So if we were to just put a uh, it, it, typically, our consulting fees are around 500 an hour, so the the value of that is around $2,500. Um, we know that most of our master trainers, um, and Annie, for example, research has shown that every one hour of facilitation time, a good trainer is going to spend anywhere from one hour preparing for that to seven hours. So we're looking at a customization process of anywhere from 16 to 112 hours of curriculum and training development integration with uh, an organization's culture, which what you've already been doing, et cetera. Um, we also put into our program three 90-minute post-training meetings um, that allow an organization at 60, 90, and 180 days just to have a conversation around, hmm, are our leaders using this material? Um, are we, is it creating change in the organization? Or what do we need to do internally or with support to uh, retain the learning and to drive leadership effectiveness? Um, uh, at a deeper, more committed level. Um, so that typical value on that is $2,250. Then on this particular pilot program, we plan, um, most of the organizations that we work with will have somewhere between 10 leaders go through the program to up to 40. Um, we'll typically, if it's 40, we'll break that into multiple sessions so that we can have a smaller unit in any particular um, engagement. Um, but for our pilot program, uh, we plan to make a really great value um, to those who want to work with us um, that is not this 27750 that you're looking at, um, but instead um, we're going to give away uh, the customization process, not charge for that. Um, any particular development on the integration with your culture, we're also going to include that for free. Um, those post sessions that are all about how do you retain this knowledge and this training inside the organization um, is really a coaching session to help the HR person who's responsible for developing their leaders put together best practices to keep the momentum of the engagement going. We're going to throw that in. Um, we're also including the first 12 assessments inside the program. Um, and then instead of our typical $16,000 fee, um, we're looking at $12,000 for three individuals that are interested in seeing if it's right for them um, and implementing it into their organization. So we feel like we've come up with a pretty phenomenal program and a pretty affordable price. What we know is that there are many organizations that spend much more than $30,000 working um, with uh, even with us in, in some of our programs on leadership development. But because we're looking at a pilot approach, and we've done this for another client, we thought that we would extend it to the folks on the call today. Um, of course, we are very aware um, that this training may not be a good fit. Uh, and so part of the purpose of the complementary leadership development consultation is to learn about your to learn about what you've got going on and whether or not this is a good model for a enterprise or workforce level uh, leadership development. So um, any, I would welcome the opportunity to take that dialogue further. And I also want to say I'm very thankful um, that you guys joined us today. Um, Annie, a fantastic job, really 
um, explaining the program and the work of leaders in a way that even if uh, an individual isn't interested in taking the model back, I think that there's value there in using some of those continuum and the competency specific information um, from this material. So oh, thank um, you. Pleasure to be here. Thank you. So any parting words, Annie? Uh, thank you, everybody, for uh, your kind attention, and uh, thank you, Anissa, and thank you, David, for uh, for making this happen. It's fun to be with you. Likewise, likewise. Thank you, everyone, for joining us, and we look forward to the opportunity to serve you and your organization. Have a great day. <laughs>